again. Um, that that uh, defensive structure has got to be tested in a way that it hasn't been tested so far since the resumption this weekend. It's a real pity that Owen Farrell, from a neutral's perspective, sabotaged uh, his participation in this game this weekend because, you know, like, there's a lot of the same bodies. I know they've, la they've lost some key individuals from last year's team, but there's a lot of the same bodies there. That, that culture is still there. This is the one game all year since they had their points deduction handed down to them that they have circled and gone, OK, we see what you're doing, we're coming for you. And it's the end of a trilogy where, between these two teams where it's like, you know, there's a, there's a lot riding on this for Saracens. It's them against the world, isn't it? It's them um, where everyone wants to hate Saracens now. Um, you know, they're cheats and they got their just rewards. Now they're demoted down to the championship. And it's only them that are thinking, wow, oh, how brilliant would it be that we've been relegated and we've been somewhat humiliated publicly, but yet we've still gone on to manage to win the Champions Cup. I, I think that would be an incredible story uh, and something that they're very much clinging on to. It's going to be... It's going to be what they're looking to for the next, you know, over, over 12, 12 months because, you know, going down to the championship, you'd imagine it'll be a formality for them to come back up. But, you know, there's not going to be the same attention. They won't be getting the same quality game time. They won't be playing in, against the best players in the world week on week or the best players in the UK even week on week. So this is, you know, this is the swan song for Brad Barrett, swan song for Richard Wigglesworth. They don't want it to be their last game. So they are going to throw absolutely everything into it. But the reality is they don't have seven of the 23 that, that were involved in the final last weekend and a couple of very, very important players for them, particularly in, uh, in the pack. You look at Will Skelton gone, you look at George Cruz gone, Lama Satele, who came off the bench after 20 minutes against uh, Leinster last year when it looked, you know, with both props gone, with Mako gone um, and, um, and was it Barrington started and Lamas Italy and Koch came in and played 60 minutes and were incredible. You don't have that reserve, that strength of depth coming in now um, if you have those sort of injuries or even on the 50 or 60 minute mark to be able to, to match if, if, you know, Leinster, if they have the likes of Porter on the bench. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's going to be... It's going to be an interesting game. I can understand why it's a nine-pointer because Leinster have been very, very impressive. But there's 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 a grudge match between these two. Um, you know, they and it is a shame that Owen Farrell isn't isn't starting. I wish he was because I think it would make he, he's every he epitomizes everything good about them um, and maybe a little bit bad of them that they yeah. play right on the edge um, and that's been his game. But um, it is a shame because you want to see him against Sexton. You want to see that aggression and that and that desire. I love watching Owen Farrell. Whether you love him or loathe him, he's he's very interesting to watch because he plays right on the line, and that's what you want with the biggest competitors in in, in the world in, in the game that you love is players that want to really bust a gut to get every last sinew out of their career. Um. How important is little subplot in this? Obviously, that would have been one great one. Maro Toje versus James Ryan is hopefully another one we see. It was a, a slightly narky James Ryan who played against England in the Six Nations, and he came in for some criticism after that. You know, hang on a second, hang on. A second. We've been asking for him for ages and ages and ages to be that, and he's got to work out how that works and how it manifests itself. I'm all that for was it. Great. Yeah, that was so good to see, and um, it didn't shock me. You know, the week after Paul O'Connell had been in camp and you could see the pictures of him and James Ryan having conversations at training. And, um, and yeah, listen, you know, I um, had made a comment that maybe they just lacked a little bit of thuggery in, that, in the pack, that, that nasty edge. Uh, and I don't know whether, I'm not saying that that's a reaction to that, but it was, from my perspective, it was lovely to see because we'd seen the athlete and, and the workhorse that James Ryan is. You want to see someone that has a bit of hate in them as well, has that little bit of an edge that is willing to push the boundaries as to what the legalities of the game are. Um, you don't want um, you know, players to go around and, and you know, from the opposition perspective to be seen as a little bit of a soft touch if they're you know, great athletes, but you know, do they have a, you know, a, a soft underbelly? Well, let me tell you, James Ryan certainly doesn't um, because of his performance, but all the more because he reinforced it with being a bit nasty against England. And that's about setting a tone, setting down a marker against players that you're going to play against for the next 
you know, nine or ten years you might play with in a line setup, and you want to earn their respect. And you're not going to do that just from you know clearing them out and you know you know t tapping them on the back after a good shot. You're going to get that from having a nasty edge to you and to you know to upsetting them and winding them up. And that's part of the game now as well of, of putting others off their game while you are the aggressor with them. So I was really impressed to see that, and hopefully we'll see a bit more. Provided, you know, he doesn't um, step over the, the, the mark too much. Yeah, too much. A little, a little bit's fine. I don't mind occasional penalties here and there at this stage of his career. It's like he can work them out in a couple of years. But in the meantime, lay down that marker. Totally. And, and I told you he's been doing it for a few years now. And, and James Ryan's only a couple of years younger than him, I think. Um, but, you know, we, we've... Again, Toji epitomized everything about Saracens. He's all in your face and he's tapping lads on the head and all that stuff that you hate. But, you know, at the same time, he's he's pulling his team together. He's a, he's a guy that you look to that's winding up the opposition, a bit like Quinny did back, you know, years ago, stepping on lads' toes when the referee's having a word um, to him. That stuff actually counts for something. It's, yes, it's gamesmanship, but it's, it's all, to, you know, it's, it's the mental side of the game as well of getting into the opposition's heads and trying to do deny them their top performance and put them off their game. And if you're able to do it while still concentrate on your own, well, all the better. Um, but yeah, that, that battle between Atoji and, and, and Mauro will be, or uh, Mauro and, um, and Ryan will be, um, will be spectacular because everyone's talking about them as potential Lions second row partners. Alan Wynne Jones might have to, something to say about that, but. It's, it's mouth-watering, and, and they'll definitely, uh, uh, on the back of the last time they played one another, be looking out to, to throw shots at, at each other, no doubt. I know you made the point about how many players who played in the final and were involved in that match day 23 for Saracens are gone, but when you look at the ones who are still there, it is a who's who of world-class talent. Toje's one, the Vinopolas are others, and they've got great, great talent at the backs as well. So there's enough there that if Leinster are 2% off, this game will be just out of reach very quickly, or at some point in the second half, like looking up, look, we're 10 points down here now and there's only 20 minutes left to go. Like, this game could get away from Leinster if they're in any way off. Well, it, it can, uh, no doubt. Sarri's, Sarri's have been playing some really good rugby as well the last few weeks. Um, they've, they're obviously um, playing with the freedom that they don't have anything at, at stake other than um, building a bit of confidence for this quarter final. Um, they, they have. Um, Quality players, even in the non-internationals, if you look at um, Jackson Ray is the ultimate club player um, who's been brilliant for them, the only one to play in all six of their pool matches. Um, you've got Brad Barrett, who's a, a previous uh, international, but has been an absolute phenomenon for Saracens for the last five or six years in particular and, and been a catalyst for a huge amount of their success. Um, um, and then you've got some firepower as well before I think Alex Good is heading off to Japan uh, in, uh, after, after the European Cup. You've got Sean Maitland, who I have to say has impressed me an awful lot more over the last couple of years with what he's done for, for Saracens in particular. So they've got plenty of firepower. Elliot Daly, another one. So yeah, they've got match winners there if they can put a good performance together. Um, so Leinster are going to need to, to bring at very least the standard they did last weekend and probably a level above that. But my sense is the, has been that they've been in kind of somewhere between third and fourth gear. I think they're going to need to be between fourth and fifth gear to, to really you know, put on a, a proper performance against Saracens and nullify their 